Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of announcing to you that we are going to make an effort to repeat the old rebel yell. One, two, We are in Bernie, Texas with master engraver Weldon Lister. Weldon, thank you for having us to your lovely workshop. Well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you all here. So we'll just start at the beginning. Um, you're a third generation engraver. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about how you got started, um, how you learned. Okay. Well, um, of course, my dad, my dad learned from his uncle. Uh, the basics of jewelry engraving and uh, that was back in the late 40s early 50s and then he progressed on uh, to learn uh, firearms engraving which was a much different technique than he had first been taught um, so I guess uh, from the time I was about six years old I was in a shop somewhat similar to this where there were a bunch of guys that were standing at a vice with a hammer and chisel and they were engraving um, Early on, much of what they were working on were the Texas Ranger commemorative Colts that uh, Charlie Schreiner had done, and that was when my dad was working for Frank Hendricks in San Antonio. And so as a kid, I would run through the shop and go, hey, what are you doing? And he would show me, you know, I'm working on this, and then I'd go, okay, you know, and out the door. So, um, you know, fast forward to, I was uh, 17 years old, and uh, my dad's health at that point in his life was kind of up and down. And someone told me, if you don't learn how to do what your dad does, one of these days he's going to be gone and you will always regret it. And I don't know really how it uh, made sense to a 17 year old kid, but all of a sudden I had this sense of urgency and I uh, went to my dad and I said, hey, uh, can you teach me how to engrave? And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll show you everything I know. What you pick up will be up to you. I said, hey, sounds like a good plan. When do we start? And so we, he worked out of his garage at his house. And so he, uh, he and I got a, uh, an extra place clean where I could set up a, a location to work. And uh, I started in August of 1979. And by October of 79, I had progressed to the point where I could, uh, under his direction, uh, engrave a gun. And so um, I did. Wow, and, that uh, seems like a really fast timeline. <laughs> well, it was. And uh, one of the things I've always encountered in my career, and I'm sure that it will end at some point, what, but uh, meeting people and then looking at me going, uh, you're too young. I was interviewed, I think, in 1980 um, by a writer for uh, uh, Night World magazine who had seen uh, a, you know, a selection of my work. And he looked me in the eye and said, and you did this, right? I said, yes, sir. You did this work. I said, yes, sir. And he didn't believe me. And he wanted to see me look him in the eye and say that I had done that. And I said, you bet. I mean, I did. Yeah. And you were like 18 at yeah, the time? Yeah, 18. <laughs> so did you draw or anything like that before? Yeah, you know, one of the worst experiences of my life, I guess, when I was a kid, before I started engraving. And you guys may not recall, but in the back of magazines, there was a time where there, there was an art school that was advertised. And you could take a correspondence. Uh -huh. Of course, this was before the internet. So, I mean, now it would be much more simple. But you, to apply, you drew, you selected one of their things and you draw it. I think I remember and, this. Yeah, yeah, and you send it in. And so I did. And I got a nasty letter back going, we don't accept tracing. And I'm like, whoa. Oh. <laughs> and if you're out there, I'm still mad about that. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, I guess I can't get into correspondence art school as a kid. You know, I like to draw and, and doodle around and stuff like that. And I probably spent the majority of my time in, uh, in school uh, thinking about hunting or shooting 
or drawing or daydreaming about that or guitars. And uh, then they would wake me up and I would go to the principal's office and uh, anyway, no. <laughs> So I'm sure this question comes up a lot when you're working the way that you do. I mean, you have to make a mistake sometime. Like, <laughs> yeah. how do you handle oh, that? I don't really do that. <laughs> I just, uh, those guys right there, the minions, <laughs> yeah. see it's great. Because oh, I just leave, awesome. I write a note and then come back and it's done. <laughs> Actually, um, one of the things that I was taught, uh, my dad, again, you know, the best way to hurry up is to take your time. Make sure your tools are sharp and don't push it. And he said, son, there will be days when you know that you probably ought to go fishing or do something other than cutting on a really expensive gun or knife. Mm -hmm. If you hit a day like that, just do something else that day and come back tomorrow because in five minutes you can create a whole day's worth of work to fix what you just did. Being a master engraver doesn't mean that you never make a mistake, but if you do, you're the only one that knows about it. It's just okay. a good one. Earlier this year when we were visiting the factories we work with in Brescia, um, we went to Cesare Giovanelli's engraving workshop. Uh -huh. yes. And he kind of, I mean, through the tour there, we learned a little bit about like some of the different styles of engraving and the different ways that people engrave. And I don't know, you have your own specialty, so can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, and for me though, I mean, I engrave a lot, uh, very similar to the way that they uh, they do in Europe. I use a hammer and a chisel, and I stand up. Now there are, if you've seen enough engraving and engraver setups, you'll know that there are some peculiarities in the height of the vise, right. the kind of vise, and you know, this and that. Well, the main object is you've got to have a vise that's solid enough to hold what you're working on and one that you can work around. And some of them look like they're really cumbersome. I mean, uh, but anyway, whatever you grow up with using seems normal to you. Mm -hmm. okay. For me, um, I have a, a ball vise, and this is a center opening a drill press vise that's on top of it, but it also rotates oh, around. So it's yeah. got a lot of, and this comes in handy. This is a little project for a, a girlfriend of my daughter's. And so it's not a, a high-end thing, and it's flat. Mm -hmm. But when you get on the top of a, a commander slide or a 1911 slide or something that's round, and in the old days when I had a one plane vice, you know, I would be standing up or down here. Yeah, or, you know, yeah I mean, that's the yeah. first thing I think of is like hand cramps and yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> and so for, for what I do, I mean, I use a, a small hammer and a chisel, and uh, a lot of the cutting, especially on uh, the guns uh, that we grew up, you know, with here in America, what we're used to seeing on Colts and Winchesters and stuff like that, what you would classify as American scroll, mm -hmm. from the heyday of engraving uh, firearms from 1850 to about 1920 in that span of time. A V tool like this makes the cuts that you're looking for in that style of engraving, and so that's that's what you use. And um, I'm lining this pattern but this pattern all of these scrolls have been cut using this tool and so I'll do a little demo of uh, what would uh, what should be happening and so one of the in the technique world um, what you're learning is tool control and uh, hammer and chisel engraving is difficult in that I'm moving my body I'm shifting my weight from side to side I'm moving it in a kind of pattern like that with my body and I'm hitting a chisel with a hammer while I'm doing all that maintaining a, a either a depth of cut or a changing the depth of it and the direction and trying to make it all look nice so there's a lot to do there's at least 11 things that are happening at the same time right now while I'm doing this and they all have to be pretty much unconscious to you. And that's really um, part of learning the process, uh, the muscle memory, the, um, the way to make the tool do what you need it to to get the effect that you want. And then 
once you understand how to do that with, with the tools, then you can focus on being creative and then you can talk while you're working. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, dad, my dad was always amazed. He said, man, I can't believe that you can talk and engrave at the same time. He said, I can either engrave or I can talk. But he said, I can't do them both together. And I said, well, Dad, I don't know why I can do that. It's probably the only multitasking thing that I can do. But he was always, you know, that's why he liked his shop at home away from people. He yeah. had one where there were a lot of people. And he said, man, I can't get any work done because everyone wants to talk. And I can't talk at yeah. work. Um, so what are some of the most memorable pieces you've ever engraved? Memorable pieces. Well, um, I did a buckle for George W. Bush that was part of a, a uh, uh, what do you say, a presentation. The American Pistol Smiths Guild put a 45 together for him as a thank you for his support of the Second Amendment, right? Mm. And uh, they did it during his first term, and then they found out that, well, if we give it to him, he has to donate it to his library. He can keep it. So they're like, well, we'll just wait. Well, then he got reelected. <laughs> so then they're still waiting. Well, in that span of time, they decided, oh, we're going to have to have a, uh, a buckle to go with this gun. And that's when they got a hold of me. And they said, would you? I'm like, I'm in. I'll do it. And so uh, I, uh, the thing, uh, how big do you want it? Well, about this big, you know, make it about like that. Make it nice. I'm like, okay. So the two things I wanted, I wanted the right of reproduction, and I wanted to be at the presentation. They're like, okay. I said, all right, then we'll go. So I'm in at the inside, uh, in the house, and I've got some books out on engraving and stuff, and I'm drawing, and Tony, my wife, comes by, and she looks, and she goes, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm working on W's buckle. <laughs> and she goes, well, that doesn't look like him. I said, well, now hang on. This is a very historic design. It goes way back to when blah, 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 blah. She goes, I don't care. That doesn't look like something he would wear. And I was like taken aback and I thought, at first I thought, okay, so who's the artist here? <laughs> and then I thought, okay, suck it up. And uh, God gave you a wife for a reason. And this is probably one of them. And I thought, okay, so what do I know about him really? Well, so I got on the internet and I found his favorite painting, which was uh, called A Charge to Keep. Big old picture that was done in 1916 by a painter named W.H.D. Kern. And I thought, well, I like Western art. I can work with that. So I adapted that uh, painting to a belt buckle. Oh. And I spent about 400 hours doing it. And so, in the meantime, I found this memo that he had written to his staff when he was governor of Texas that said, because they hung it into the governor's office where when you came in, that was there. They took the ranger crossing the Pecos down and they put this painting up. And he said, when, to his staff, he said, take a note. When you come in and you see this painting, he said, I want you to remember this man is on a mission serving something greater than himself. And folks, that's what we do here every day. I want you to remember that. And I thought, well, by golly, if he thinks that much of this painting, maybe he'll like the buckle. So at the presentation, I get it out and give me, he goes, well, a charge to keep. And he kind of straightened up. He said, men, let me tell you about this. <laughs> and he told almost verbatim off of that memo. And I thought, man, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Right out of the park. You know, I thought, geez, if I hadn't listened to my wife, oh. if I would have if I would have gotten, you know, prideful, which was my yeah. first reaction, you know, and told her, Well, what do you know about engraving your artwork, you know? Uh, I would have been he would have gone, Oh, how about that? Well, thanks. You yeah. Know? <laughs> oh man. But instead That's awesome. Yeah, it it, it felt like you bottom of the ninth, bases are loaded and man, yeah. you just hit one out of the park. So I was like very thankful for my wife pointing that out. Look, y'all have guns. I don't. Yeah, yeah. See how this works? Entertain me. I don't know what to say. It's okay. Thanks. You're a funny guy telling some jokes. <laughs> uh, speaking of jokes, when um, 
there was a magazine article that came out, and they asked me if there were things I don't engrave. And yeah, I said no, I don't do nudes, and I don't do things that are to me that are on the across the border from what I want to do. And marijuana leaves, right? And uh, believe it or not, I had a client ask for that, a prospective client. And I said no, that's just not you know. I mean, I'm not a cartel engraver. I'm not gonna be. Yeah. I don't want to be in that identify with that so I'm sorry I mean if you like it that's fine but it's not for me mm -hmm. so and I'm the one doing it so the magazine comes out and I flip open the front cover and there's a map of all the stories in there and I, there was a map on close to where I live and I said whoa somebody's in here from there I thought how cool <laughs> being the idiot I am I didn't realize this <laughs> then I read I don't do nudes I'm like gosh could they use any other <laughs> quote for that <laughs> Oh, so, uh, a so, friend of mine, yeah. a friend of mine, <laughs> sends me this. Let me see. I gotta put my eyeballs on, man. <laughs> and it's uh he's an artist, right? Well, for <laughs> no. Well, after enough. you said you wouldn't do the pot leaves, was was Willie Nelson disappointed? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, he's on the road again. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway. Well, that questions. brings me back around to your dad. Uh -huh. Like, Big Bill Lister, aside from being a master engraver, one of the greats, is also one of the great country western singers, the tallest country western singer. Yeah, I think. Probably <laughs> six, seven and a half. Yeah. And, uh, I, uh, when my dad uh, was young, uh, as he got older, he kind of got bent over, but he wore cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. And when I was little, and I looked up at my dad, he looked like he was 10 feet tall, <laughs> seriously, because he was he was pretty skinny. He was lean, yeah. And that tall, and then would put a boots and uh, put boots and a hat on him, and man, and uh, and then I grew up and I realized that he really was 10 feet tall, <laughs> and uh, it's pretty wild. I, uh, you know, you just kind of think of your dad as your dad, and no matter who your dad is, I guess you do, you know, because it's just your dad, right? But not to everybody else. And uh, I couldn't go on this trip with him, but my son did. They went to Nashville and they were filming a documentary, I think it was for Time Life, about uh, Hank Williams. And so he came back and I mean, it was a cool experience for him and stuff. And he said, Dad, I really didn't realize who Granddad was until we were in the Hard Rock Cafe in Nashville. And there's a picture of him in the Hard Rock Cafe with Hank. And he said, then it kind of hit me that he was way more than just my granddad. And I said, well, yeah, you know, pretty. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, of course, you know the tear of my beer story, right? Yeah, but please share it with our audience. My dad was on the radio in San Antonio, and he also did a lot of live performances here. And he got as big as he could get here. And everybody kept telling him, because he would meet all the stars that came through on their, you know, circuit that they would play. And uh, he, he knew a bunch of them, including Tex Ritter, right? And they would tell him, Bill, you got to go to Nashville. You know, you're not, you're not going to do anything here. You need to be in Nashville. So uh, a friend of his had a cabin on the Cumberland River. And he told me, anytime you want to come up here, just come on. So he and my mother loaded up their car, shut their house, and drove to Nashville. Got to the cabin on the Cumberland River, and it was the worst snowstorm in the history of Tennessee. And they were <laughs> snowed in there for about a week. Oh. And he thought, well, I don't know how this is going to go. Well, anyway, he went to all the record companies and did auditions. And they said, well, are you on the Opry? And no. Well, if you were on the Opry, we could give you a, a record contract. I'm like, all right, I'll go see the Opry. So a guy named Jim Denny ran the Opry at that time, and he auditioned with Jim, and Jim said, have you got a record contract? No. He said, well, if you had a record contract, I could get you a spot on the Opry. <laughs> so it's like this, Dad said, well, you know, okay. And Jim said, what are you going to do, Bill? And he said, you know, I, I saw some of the best squirrel hunting woods and fishing holes I've seen. I think I'm going to stick around for a little bit and see what happens. So he did, uh, you know, a week or so, and uh, Tex Ritter came to town, and Dad uh, knew, and he called, and Tex said, well, did you talk to D. Kilpatrick at Capitol Records? 
No, and he said, yeah, but he turned me down. He said, meet me out there. And so dad walks in to the thing. Tex walks in and tells the guy, get a contract and sign this boy right now. The guy opens his drawer, gets a contract out. Yes, sir. And he signs a recording contract. So <laughs> dad awesome. says, okay, well, I got somewhere to go. I'll see you later. <laughs> and he goes to the Opry and uh, he, uh, Jim Denny, well, what are you doing, Bill? He said, well, I just want to see if you're a man of your word, Jim. He said, how do you mean? He said, well, I've got a recording contract here with Capital. He said, fantastic. He goes, hang on a second. He turns around, gets on the phone, and talking to somebody. He turns back. He said, how'd you like to open up on the road for Hank Williams? And Dad said, well, sure. If he had had me, I'd be glad to. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll put you on the Opry, and you're going to be traveling with Hank as his opening act. And uh, so that's how that all got started. In about three weeks, he went from Texas Hillbilly to I got a contract, I'm on the Opry, and I'm over, you know, working with Hank Williams. <laughs> and Hank was pretty much at the, the zenith of his career right about then. And so it was a great time. They were playing the biggest uh, venues that were available, including the Hattacall Caravan, which was a very famous uh, medicine show that traveled by train. And so, anyway, they were coming in off the road, uh, going back to Nashville, and, and when they came in, they would record shows for Mother's Best Flower, and then if they had time, they would do a recording session for their labels. And Hanks was MGM, and Dad's was Capital. And so, Dad said, man, he goes, i got to have a beer drinking song. And at that time, beer drinking songs were not played on the Opry, and they were not played on the radio, but they were played on jukeboxes. And Dad had done stuff like blowing the suds off my beer, beer drinking blues, beer drinking daddy, which was pretty funny because he wasn't a beer drinker. <laughs> but that's what Capital had him doing, you know, how the label thing is, and that's what they wanted. And so he was doing it, and... Uh, but he didn't have a beer drinking song and they cut four songs at a session and they were cut on an acetate disc and so hank said hoss i got one that'll cock your pistol and so hank had a recording session the night before my dad at the end of his session he told the the band y'all can go but i need the engineer to stay i've got to cut a demo record and so he cut there's a tear in my beer and then on the other side was a song called All the Love I Never Had or Ever Had or, or something like that. And uh, once he was done, he gave the record to Dad. Dad went home, learned the song, because neither one of them read music. They just did it phonetically, right? And uh, he went home, learned the song. The next night, Dad was in Castle Studios, and he recorded There's a Tear in My Beer, which was released on Capitol. The original acetate he put in a box with a bunch of other stuff. Well, fast forward some years, and he left the music business. The box came to San Antonio, where it stayed in the garage, moved to Bernie, where it went to the attic, and it stayed for decades, until he and my mother decided to clean out the attic. And they found it, and uh, found this box of records, which most of them were blistered and bubbled and worthless. And my mother said, well, what is this stuff? And Dad said, eh, just throw it away. It's a bunch of old junk. And she said, well, why don't we listen to some of these? Well, when he found the Tear in My Beer record and put it on, he realized he had never heard that song ever released. And he thought, you know, I've got to have the only version of this, because if they had it, they would have put it out by now. Yeah. This is about 1989. And so, as luck would have it, one day the phone rang, and it was Hank Jr. And he said, hey, uh, I need to talk to Weldon. And uh, like, hello. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I mean, we had met before. I came home from uh, school about 1973 or 74, and he was sitting on the couch talking to my dad. And like, <laughs> dad's like, oh, this is Hank Williams Jr. I said, okay, well, I got to have a snack and I got to go play. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, whatever. And so I had no clue. But anyway, um, he says, hey, uh, um, I understand you're engraving. And, uh, you know, I've got some of your dad's guns in my collection. And since you've started, I'd like to have some of yours to go along with what I've got of your dad's. And we're on tour in San Antonio uh, on Friday night. And if it's okay, Saturday, we'll just run out and visit. And, you know, we'll talk about it. I said, sure. 
Now, what I really said was, I don't know, let me check my schedule. I'll have my people get with your people, <laughs> and uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll do lunch, baby. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, it'll, we'll make it happen. It'll work. Uh, now, I said, yeah, that'd be great. And so, uh, Saturday they came out, and you know, we chewed the fat, talked about guns and engraving and uh, stuff like that. And, I mean, he's a very nice person to visit with and uh, knows an awful lot about guns. And we got all of our business done. And once we were finished, uh, my dad said, I want y'all to listen to something. And at the time, Merle Kilgore was Hank's manager. And Merle and dad went way back to the Hank senior days. They known each other, you know, from then. And uh, when he put that needle on, man, their eyes bugged out. And uh, Merle said, for God's sake, Bill, don't scratch it. Take the needle off. <laughs> and so he took it off and took the record off of the player. And uh, Junior said, Bill, what are you going to do with that? And he said, son, your daddy gave this to me a long time ago. I think it belongs to you. And he just handed it to him. And, of course, he was like, oh, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, he was didn't know what to think. Well, so they left. And uh, um, what we didn't know, I mean, we didn't know what was going to happen after that. But uh, Warner Brothers sent a dude with an environmentally controlled briefcase to put that record in so nothing would happen to it, which made my dad laugh so hard because of where that, that thing had been in the attic for Pete's sake in the summer in Texas, probably 200 degrees and uh, baking for years, and uh, it had made it all that time. But uh, So then, you know, they did the Tear My Beer duet and all that kind of stuff. And it, was, it was a pretty cool time. And oh, so man. Merle went on Nashville Now, which was a TV show, uh, pretty cool, uh, country music TV show at the time told the story played the video well they what they wanted to do was say where this record had come from because he said people are going to want to know you know how did this happen <coughs> and so they tell the story about dad well dad had a lot of fans that had no idea what happened to him well, man his phone started ringing I think the next morning a radio station, the biggest one in San Antonio, was on the phone. Hey, can you come in and do an interview? You know, we want to talk. And it never stopped until the time he died. I mean, people were wanting to know about that story. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild. I'm the kid who didn't break that record when I was little. I want you to know that. You're the DJ that didn't learn how to scratch on Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, if I had found that box of records, it would have probably been over. The world would have never heard it. But uh, but anyway, I didn't, and uh, uh, it was oh, fun. man, that's amazing. Yeah, he did a bunch of stuff for Capitol, and uh, his first sessions were <clears throat> more, um, they didn't have the real the Hank Williams type sound. They were, uh, I know you like RC Cola and Moon Pie. How do you know that? Well, <laughs> I just have an idea that you do. And uh, so his, if you listen to that song, uh, it's a little different than his later stuff, but they did that on purpose because he was traveling with Hank, and they figured that for his music to sound like it did on the record, yep. instrumentation-wise, uh, they better use a steel and a fiddle and, uh, and not a mandolin and a piano. Yeah. they're a little harder to put in a Cadillac in 1951. Yeah. <laughs> RC Cola and a moon, moon pie. pie. RC Cola and moon pie. You can you can chip in for this episode. Right? Exactly. Our <laughs> so, sponsors. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, RC Cola and Moon Pie. Yeah. You have no idea that we're doing this, but yeah. uh, we want to thank them anyway. This is uh, what's known as a working man's lunch. If you're as thin as your dad, you can get away with this. <laughs> yeah. This better be the last time we ever do this. <laughs> we don't normally. Have RC color in my shop, but for special, it's yeah, like, it's oh, not. It's a uh, reserve. I think it has real sugar in it, so it's it's seriously health food. Yeah, this is this is this is as healthy as it gets my in a way. <laughs> I've heard. All right, we're gonna try not to let this get all over the place. Love uh, the Love's Market. Yeah, and we Don't go in that. there. They got moon pies, hey. but they didn't have RC, so we had to cross the street and get the RC. All right. You stop at nothing. <laughs> I want you to know, this folks. This is high production value. They, Bryce and Jamie will stop it. Yeah. For, for the effect. All right, folks. Okay. We're toasting <laughs> your show. RC so, Cola and Moon Pie. You know. The and, history uh, of engraving. Yep. And the listers. Big Bill. And Hank. There you go. Mm.
Non, pas eu. C'est comme Charlie Brown's teacher. Il est mangé, moi. Bon. Je ne vais pas faire ça de nouveau. Jamie's going, please, hurry. Jamie's going to be like, when we get out to the car, she's going to be like, what'd you do with the rest of that moon yeah. pie? <laughs> <laughs> Give us some room here. All right, with the, with the moon pie still in my teeth, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and, uh... Till next time. There's a tear in my ear As I'm crying for you Um